Um, I am so honored to get to introduce Brian Littleton. He is, most of you already know him. He is the CEO and founder of ShareASale. Um, you have probably seen articles by him and seen that he is the three-time winner. I gotta read this. You guys will understand why once I read it. The three-time winner of the affiliate semicle, <laughs> semicle, summit, Pinnacle Award for the Affiliate Marketing Advocate of the Year because of all the work he's done in um, fighting against laws that will keep uh, people from being able to do affiliate marketing in their state. So he's done that and much, much more for the industry. He is also the president of the board of the PMA, the Performance Marketing Association. Um, he's accomplished so much. And because of that, it really surprised me when I first met him. I was at his conference, and I happened to mention in conversation that I was trying to figure out how I could better monetize my blog. And he took an hour of his time out of his conference and sat down with me, looked at my blog, and went through it with me to um, help come up with ideas. So despite that he owns the company, that he's won all these awards, he is such a kind an amazing guy, which I think you'll um, be able to see how many relationships he's developed based on his fan club coming in through the back door. Um, they are all dressed in what Brian would prefer, his sweater vests. So this just allows you to see what kind of person Brian is. If he has this many relationships with the people in the room and um, has uh, convince this many people to dress like him. So I am very honored to welcome Brian Littleton from ShareASale up to the stage. I know how Jim felt. Uh, good morning, is everybody excited? I am very excited. That's uh, probably as excited as I've ever been. Um, and I've also got some really good news for you. Today is going to be entirely about you. Every single person in this audience today has made a significant investment to get here. Um, you've come from far away, you've uh, spent time, you've spent money, and we're going to make that really valuable for you today. And how am I going to do that? So we're going to pretend we're in a one-on-one -on -one conversation with each and every one of you out there. I did this because I'm really good at one-on-one -on -one conversations. I don't know yet whether I'm any good at keynotes at all, but I know I'm good at one-on-one -on -one conversations. So we're going to have one. Don't do that. So we're going to have one. In this conversation, you've just asked me the following question. Brian, how do I take that very next step in my business? It's a common question I get. Um, people say, hey, I want to grow my business. I want to do this. I want to do that. The people in the audience today, you've come here for probably three things. You've come here for advice. Uh, you've come here for, to learn about a product, maybe a service. But the one thing that I could absolutely guarantee that you came here for is to grow your business. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to show you a series of what I call business justifications. Now, first of all, what the heck is a business justification? It's kind of like a pillar, it's kind of like a foundation or a principle or something like that, but it's a little bit different. And the way I think about it is, when I make decisions or I take actions in business, I'm constantly having to justify those actions. I have employees asking me, why do I do uh, something I do? I have customers asking me, like, why is it that you do it this way and not that way? And so I have to justify the decisions and actions that I take. Business justifications actually give you a reason for what you do, so you can be consistent in that business action. So we've got four that we want to go over today. One, we're going to show you how to make decisions consistently. I can't promise you that you're always going to make the right decision, but I am going to show you a method on which you can build consistent decision making over time, which is really critical. Number two, we're going to deal with angry customers or problems. This is obviously critical in today's world of the consumer economy where people can go on and leave you messages and Facebooks and, and Yelp reviews and all those kinds of things. Number three, we're going to learn how to have fun in business, but actually what that really means to have fun in business. And number four, we're going to show you how to surround yourself with the very best. So these are my four business justifications. And I want you to take them with you today and make them your own. 
You'll probably grow upon that. You'll probably have your own. But these are my four, and we're going to go over them. So again, today is entirely about you. But first, it's about me. <laughs> I need you to go to the following website on your phones and your uh, laptops and whatnot if you'd like to play along. We've got a few polls and things uh, to make the, the presentation a little interactive. Um, you go to this place, pollev.com slash Brian Littleton. You should be presented with the following question. How many affiliate summits have you attended? This is kind of like a warm-up poll. So just go ahead and see if we can get some, uh, some action on here. It should show up if people are doing it. Oh, it works. So we've got some experience. Oh, nobody, nobody in the first one? There we go. Good. So there's a lot of new timers out there. I'll let you fill in a couple more, let a few more people participate before we move on. That's good. Everybody's got the feel for it. Now when you're on that website, when we get to an actual poll question where we're going to do a little interaction, you can just stay there. Cool. A lot of newbies. This is kind of fun. I just want to watch. Do you guys mind? <laughs> uh, all right. Good. Let's move on. All right. Again, today is about you. Now, don't be alarmed. I'm actually going to show you a whole lot of pictures today. But I am going to tell you at the end why we've looked at all these pictures. Uh, a lot of these pictures, as, uh, as some of you know who know me, are from uh, uh, parties and share cell parties that we've had over the years. Uh, but that isn't what we only do. Don't worry, we're not always dressed in costume at share sale and drinking in the middle of the day. Uh, don't be too alarmed, but there are some fun photos. When I uh, was going to... I was asked to be the keynote here today. Um, I did what I usually do, and I went out and I said, all right, I need to ask some friends. I'm like, what do, what do you guys want to want to see in a keynote? What do you want to hear from me? What's the most important thing that I could tell you? And the vast majority of those responses, they said, Brian, we want to hear like, how you did it, how you built ShareASale. I want to hear some old funny stories. I want to I hear how you got from A to B with ShareASale. And honestly, I was a little worried that would be boring. <laughs> All right, so I wanted to do something better. I wanted to do something uh, more exciting. I wanted to do something more broad, something that was more high impact, something more valuable. So by way of introduction, the people that don't know me, uh, I did found ShareASale in the year 2000. I've been doing this for about 15 years. But I want to start a little further back. This is me in middle school learning how to play the piano. This is me graduating or, or being at Vanderbilt University. Um, and the thing I can tell you from Vanderbilt University is I was an absolutely horrible student. I was uh, kind of squandering around like any other uh, college kid in my sophomore year, not really knowing what I was doing. I think I was majoring in economics or possibly English. I'm not sure. And my roommate, who's pictured here with the kazoo, um, he came into me and he said, uh, he said, Brian, you should really try out, you should go to my computer science class. I think you'll really like it. Uh, and so I did. And it was uh, Computer Science 101. It was like learning Pascal. Anybody learn Pascal? Yeah, right? Turns out computer science gets way harder after that. Uh, <laughs> but I was really good at this very first class. And for the first time that I, that I can remember, I was really excited about having a direction. I was like, here's somebody I can talk to, a computer. And I learned how to program, how to do those kind of things. I did manage to graduate, which was a minor miracle. And I moved out to San Francisco. I received exactly one job offer uh, when I graduated, so naturally, I took it. Here I am, pictured in my first job. <laughs> Turns out to have been my only job. Um, and it just really wasn't for me. Um, there was, uh, uh, it was too big of a company for me. It was, I was working for Sprint, who has like uh, 50 million employees or something, and I was just one of many, and I didn't really like it. So I branched out and I said, I'm going to do something by myself. I'm going to do uh, website designing. I'm going to use my programming skills. I, beat, I built some uh, e-commerce shopping platforms, did some of that stuff or whatnot. And then I started upon this side project, which would become ShareASale Future. And from this little side project, uh, I've built ShareASale into one of the larger networks. We've got 4,000 plus retailers on the network. We've handed out hundreds of millions of dollars in commissions. No, I'm not going to tell you the exact number. Um, and I'm not telling you this to brag about my success. I'm telling you this because it's relevant to today's presentation. I want you to know that I've been there. I've been through some things. I've had tough times. I've had tough decisions to make. 
and I used my four business justifications to make my way through. Quick side note, that is my brother, proof that he exists. Some people don't believe me. They say that you're, you're answering the phone with one hand, and you're like, this is Brian, how can I help you? Oh, that's a hard question. I'm gonna give you to Mike. Uh, Mike, this is Mike, how can I help you? <laughs> now, that's my younger brother, and um, if, uh, he doesn't really come to conferences too much, uh, but if he does, you should thank him. If not for just this one specific thing, I originally wanted to call ShareASale Gagba.com. He stopped me from doing that. So uh, <laughs> if, you, if you see him, you can thank him just for that specific thing. All right, there's three quick things I want you to keep in mind while I go through these justifications. For one, I started from zero-ish. Now, this isn't a rags to riches story. I wasn't on the street, um, a destitute or whatnot, but I did start with zero money and zero experience. This is me pictured playing the piano, earning more money than I earned really in my first couple of years as the owner of ShareASale. Um, number two, going out on your own can seem actually really lonely. That's okay, we're gonna talk about that. Being on your own or working on your own, you oftentimes don't have anybody to talk to except for your dog. Um, when you're working in a larger corporation, oftentimes you're able to, if you come up across a, a problem, you can say, okay, I don't, I don't know what to do here. I gotta walk over and talk to somebody. I gotta talk to a, a mentor or a boss or another employee. When you're on your own, you don't have that. So we're gonna work through some things in order to try and solve those problems. And number three, ideas are just ideas. I didn't need a million dollar idea to make a million dollars. What I needed to do was execute upon my good ideas. And we're gonna talk about that a lot. All right. So let's get right to it. You guys ready? Yeah. That's good. I like that. All right. Business justification number one. I call this the last 30 days. So one of the very, very first business decisions I had to make, um, and again, remember, I'm coming from zero experience, was whether or not we would allow what was called adware into the ShareASale network. I come into the, the office one day. And I get this call, and uh, it's from my friend Heiko, pictured on screen. And he goes, hey, Brian, Brian, do you accept BHOs and parasite wear into your programs? So I was like, well, first of all, what in the heck are you talking about? I don't know what that is. That's just Heiko's terminology for what is adware. And remember, this is 2001. This is an old story. Um, and I absolutely hate adware, right? It's uh, internet garbage. Everybody knows that saying, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should, and this is like the best example in our industry of that cliche. Uh, but that's not really that interesting. Everybody knows that about me, and that's not why we're talking about it. We're talking about it because it leads to and is relevant to my first business justification. In business, you need to consider not only the immediate impact of a decision, which are the first 30 days, but more importantly, the last 30 days of impact. And that's a quote from me just now. <laughs> in the first 30 days, the impact of going back and, and meaning to frame this with the adware conversation, in the first 30 days of my decision, if I had said, you know what, yeah, I do, I do love pop-ups. I want to do that. I want to I work with the adware guys. I want to I do that. The first 30 days of impact would have meant money for me. This is a dog at an ATM. Just thought it was kind of a funny picture. Uh, it would have meant more money for me, undoubtedly. But the last 30 days is what I really wanted to focus on. And for me and a lot of business owners, the last 30 days are those days when you're really trying to sell your company and retire to Hawaii, like Tim Storm. Um, <laughs> in the last 30 days, you're going to be scrambling around putting together these TPS reports and expenses and talking about your business. And hopefully there's a buyer there that's going to say, yeah, I'm going to give you uh, three times your revenue, five times your revenue, 20 times, or if you're Facebook, 500 million times your revenue. Um, in my book, AdWare revenue doesn't count. This was my decision. Um, so I'm looking at, what if this guy comes to me and says, yeah, I'm going to offer you five times the revenue for your business, but I'm going to take away 40% of your actual revenue number, and that's going to be your actual number. That's a big difference. AdWare to me doesn't count. It's not valuable. Something, somebody coming along to buy it would look at it and say, like, I, I don't want this. Who would want to buy this? Now, a lot of people gave me credit for an ethical decision, uh, which, with regards to AdWare, some, there is some ethics involved. And a lot of people were critical of me. 
and said, hey, well, you know, you, you don't have the top affiliates in your network. But this is important. I knew it was the best business decision I could make because it was based on my business justifications that I already had. I had already decided how I was going to operate and how I was going to make decisions. And all I had to do was apply the situation to that justification. Who remembers fine clicks? Not too many. Is uh, Zach Johnson in the room? He would remember. Is he there? There he is. <laughs> all right, so fine clicks. This is a story to kind of uh, illustrate my point. Fine Clicks was a company that ShareASale acquired um, a long time ago, I don't know. And at the time, it was a pretty well-run network, uh, but it was different than ShareASale. ShareASale's focused mostly on uh, retail products and things, and, and Fine Clicks was more lead generation and uh, software products and things like that. It was just different. It was very well-run. And I come in one day, and there's this guy on the phone, and he's using a whole lot of language that you might actually here in a John Levine comedy routine. <laughs> Sorry, John, I had to get, get you back for last year. All right. There's this guy on the phone, and he's yelling and screaming at me, using a lot of bad language, and he's saying, uh, you've ruined my business, you've ruined my computer, you've done all these kinds of things. And I turned to my, my, my brother and I said, did I, did I do that? I don't think I did. And so I did what I usually do, and I gave the guy a call. I said, you know, what's, what's going on? And it turns out that he had um, installed some software on his computer. The software was called Purity Scan. And Purity Scan was designed to clean porn off of your computer. Uh, I think he was giving his computer to his son to go off to college or something, and Purity Scan was supposed to check your computer and just make sure there was no pictures on there or whatever. It was a program designed to do that. And Purity Scan did do that. Except, of course, this was like 2004 or whenever, so when you downloaded software, you oftentimes got something else. And Purity Scan had this adware on his machine, and he had left his computer on overnight, and there was a pop-up for every single minute overnight. And so when he came into his computer, obviously he had all kinds of stuff all over his computer. He couldn't use it. He was very mad, hence the bad language, and he calls me. In every single one of these pop-ups were the words findclicks.com. And how we got here, kind of an, uh, from an unrelated issue, we had terminated the actual merchant who was involved in these kind of things. And so it was just showing like an error message. It said findclicks error, basically. And so he got my number and all that kind of stuff. It's a funny memory for me and a funny story, but what if that were my actual business model? What if my business model was to say, you know what, I'm going to get some guy, I'm going to trick him into downloading some software so it shows a bunch of pop-ups, and then I'm going to sell him pop-up removal software in those pop-ups. What if that was my business model? I wouldn't be able to show my face in public. And try explaining that to an investor or a buyer at the end. You have to remember to write it down, use this 30-30 test, and make consistent business decisions along the way. All right, that's one. Remember, we've got four major business justifications. Number two is solve the problem and not the blame. So this is a poll question. Um, what's the very first word that comes to mind when you first find out that someone has filed a Better Business Bureau complaint against your company or left you a really bad one-star review on Yelp, right? Now this isn't filtered, so put up there whatever you want. Missy told me it's 21 and over, so uh, whatever words you want to use. And this is what you would expect, right? Uh, you, this is, these are the feelings that you get. Everybody has had this, right? Everybody ha has a business. Everybody has seen the one-star review or the, the Facebook review with no comment, and you're like, ah, you know? You, you, uh, you have these kinds of emotions. <laughs> those are good. Those are good. Uh, Ray must be here. That's good. I probably could have just done this for an hour. <laughs> all right. So uh, the emotions we all feel, right? That's natural. You've got those emotions when someone does that to you. But really, the, the number one question is, how should I respond to that? Now, these are, this question is actually one of the most number one things that people come to me and ask. Uh, Brian, I've, I've, had a, I've had a complaint, or Brian, I've had a 
an employee who is unhappy and he wants to leave, or maybe he left and went to a competitor, uh, how should I respond to that? Um, and it's, quite frankly, if I were to give one piece of advice, this would be the section that I would give. Now, you can get angry and you can react with violence. <laughs> it's not recommended. Uh, I don't know if there was ever any contact made there, but um, you can react with violence, or I've got a quote for you. When you live in reaction, you give your power away. Now, your power, what I'm talking about, is who you are, who, you, who, who your company is. You decide uh, what your branding is. You decide what your messaging is of what a company is. You start with the power of doing that. Oops. And those who attack you and try to uh, get you out of that are getting you off of your brand message, off of your game. They're trying to take away the power that you have. I'm going to show you some ways to keep it, keep that power. Over the years, I've made a lot of great friends in this industry. I'm going to go some quick pictures and just some friends. Here's some friends. More friends. <laughs> you had to know that one was coming up, right? <laughs> These guys. And Rexanne, of course. We all miss Rexanne. One of my best friends in the entire industry reported me for false and misleading advertising. This is how we were introduced. I came into the office. Like I said, no, I'm not going to tell you who it is. I came into the office, and I either I think I actually had a letter or an email or whatnot from the Better Business Bureau. And it was like, you have uh, false and misleadingly advertised. Uh, and I'm like, whoa, again, did I do this? I don't remember doing this. And what had happened was, uh, so ShareASale has, of course, uh, uh, merchant programs. When an affiliate applies for a program, uh, the merchant either approves or declines the application. And there are certain programs that are called auto-approval programs. In this particular program, the affiliate had noticed it was an auto-approval program. So he said, all right, I'm excited about this. I'm going to sign up and be auto-approved. And he was, except for two days later, the merchant looked it over and decided that he would actually rather decline this particular affiliate. So an auto-approve actually became more of an auto-decline. And for this, he didn't blame the merchant. He blamed me for this false and misleading advertising. So instead of arguing over the nuances, defending my particular practice. I took the blame for this. I don't know if it's exactly what I actually thought was the real problem, but I did take the blame for it. And I said, you know what? Uh, this, this, was, uh, this was our fault. We shouldn't have done this. We should, we'll, we'll, we'll redesign the, uh, the interface and whatnot. Instead of letting him attack me and, and use those emotions and feel like I need to go out and defend myself, instead, I decided to get back to the message. And the message that I have from Sherisel is we're a friendly company. So I was going to be friendly, I was going to solve that problem and take the power back from this individual. So this was common sense, right? Why am I even telling you this? Not common sense. <laughs> it's because it fits in with a larger issue. Now, who knows the movie The Rising Sun? Uh, yeah, right? It's a pretty good movie. It's a little old and, and maybe a little dated, but um, there's a character in there, Sean Connery and Wesley Snipes are the two actors. In my entire time in business, I don't know why, maybe it's because I love Sean Connery, but he has this particular quote, and he says, no, I'm not going to do it in a Sean Connery accent, by the way. <laughs> I tried it. I was practicing it. I tried it. It did not work. It was like British, and he's Scottish. You know, it doesn't work. All right, so the Japanese have a saying. Sean Connery is, is, a, is a Japanese uh, liaison with business here in the, for the people that haven't seen the movie. And he says, the Japanese have a saying, fix the problem and not the blame. Find out what's messed up and fix it, and nobody gets blamed. We're always, and he's talking about businesses in the United States, he says, we're always after who messed up, and their way is better. And this has stuck with me absolutely the entire time that I've been in, in, in business. You can't let negativity get you down, all right? Uh, now, this can be when a customer calls and says, uh, I don't like what you've done, or I think that you've messed up, or I think... Uh, possibly an employee does something, like throw a ping-pong paddle through a window. Um, instead of assigning blame, just take the responsibility to yourself and go out and solve that problem. The response that I've had from people, and especially the one individual um, who had the Better Business Bureau complaint, the response that I got was over-the-top good, right? I learned very early on that if I took this approach, 
that they were going to really respect my uh, business, respect my decisions, and respect me in a much different way. I've used this justification to create a good company culture. That's for the share of sailors. Is there a good company culture? That was your cue. <laughs> I've used this justification to create a company culture. I've used it to provide great customer service, and I've used it to drive what products we will actually uh, create. So that's two. Business justification number three, you have to enjoy it. Uh, work shouldn't suck. That's a quote from Tim Storm, founder of Fat Wallet. Now, Tim's not here, but there might be some Fat Walleters here. Not a single one. That's unbelievable. There's a lot of them. Uh, so work shouldn't suck. In order for customers to love your brand, you've got to love it first. And that's a quote from me again. Now, what does this mean? It's not just about goofing off. Uh, it's not just about literally having fun at work. It's not about having ping pong tables in your office or whatnot, uh, and DJs in your office. But you are affiliate marketers. You are in the best position. You are entirely so lucky. You could be a banker. You need to take that fun and move it on through your entire, your entire business. Don't be afraid to carry a fun atmosphere into real business decisions. I can remember uh, years back, we had an RFP from uh, uh, an un unnamed company. And they came to me, and, and, uh, and I was excited to be included in the RFP initially because, you know, we were growing our business. And I got going through this thing and interacting with them and calling them and, and dealing with their questions and all kinds of stuff. And I realized at some point that, yeah, sure, I want to have this business. It would be good monetarily for my business. But this client was absolutely going to suck. Like, it was going to be absolutely horrible for our business to have to deal with this. And so, again, I went back to my business justifications. I said, well, work shouldn't suck. So I am not going to work with this. Don't be afraid to use the fun atmosphere and carry it through to actual real business decisions. I'm not telling you not to work hard or not to deal with difficult clients. But it shouldn't absolutely suck. If it does, you're doing entirely the wrong thing. So that's three of four. And I promise not to be boring. So we're going to take a break, and we're going to do a quick top 10. <laughs> it is a good picture, isn't it? Uh, we'll do a quick break. Uh, so top 10. I'm going to give you 10 things that I want you to do. Number one, watch TV. Well, heck, that's easy. Uh, and I'm not going to tell you that I want you to watch TV for entertainment purposes, but I'm going to tell you to watch TV for two very specific shows and for a specific purpose. Number one, I want you to watch The Prophet, Marcus Leonis. Wow. That's the best slide all day. I want you to watch The Prophet, and I want you to watch Shark Tank. Now, you're probably more familiar with Shark Tank, so I'm going to start with The Prophet. The Prophet is a show, again, Marcus Leonis is a, a, a successful business person. And he goes in and he talks to small businesses. They're mostly family businesses and usually um, struggling. And he goes in and in exchange for usually some kind of investment and for some stake in the company, he fixes it. And he helps them build their business up. Now, sure, it's entertaining, but I don't want you to watch it for entertainment. I want you to put yourself in the position of both parties. I want you to be the small business, the family business. And I want you to be Marcus. He's hard hitting. And it's easy to, to laugh and poke fun of the business in which he's hitting hard. But everybody makes those mistakes. And if you're actually really honest about yourself and honest about your business, whether it's your own or whether you work in a larger company and it's your role, if you're really honest about it, and when he asks you a question, I want you to answer it out loud before they do. Because I want you to hear yourself answer the question in an honest fashion about your own business. And then listen to how he responds. Listen to the, to the business owners. If you watch the show consistently, it's like having a free business advisor because everybody has these same problems. Sure, they might be framed in a different way on the show, but everybody has these same problems. And sometimes you need a guy to be really hard hitting and you might not have that in your business. So instead, you've got Marcus. Once you get good at that, you can start pretending that you're Marcus. Look at the problems that these family businesses and these small businesses have and try to say the answer out loud before Marcus does it. Trust me, if you do this for a number of months, you're really going to get good at it. It's really going to help your business. The second part of that is Shark Tank. 
Now, like I said, most people are familiar with Shark Tank a little bit more, probably. Um, but I want you to watch this show in a very specific way as well. There's not a single show on TV, and there's really no way to do this in a quicker, ma quicker manner to learn how investors and people who buy businesses really value those businesses and really look at the revenue involved and the service and the product. It is like an education in one hour. If you watch this show consistently, put yourself in the position of those people pitching products. Try to come up with the answers when those guys come back with those questions. And even more importantly, once you get good at that, try to be the sharks. When the guy walks in and says, I want to do this, and he shows the product or whatnot, you should get good at at it enough to know whether or not you would put your money in that business. It's about learning how to value businesses, and it's an enormous education. Number two, stop telling yourself that you're so busy. I hear this all the time. Now, I'm not going to say you're not busy or not working hard, but stop using it as an actual excuse to stop yourself. When you say you're too busy, you're giving yourself, you're really underwriting yourself. We have a thing at ShareASale. It's called off the wheel. Um, and so a hamster, you know, a hamster runs on a wheel, runs on a wheel. And if he stays on that wheel, that's all he ever does. Um, and only when he gets off the wheel can he eat and drink and do all those other things. So we have two hours every single week at ShareASale that are called off the wheel. You're not even allowed to work on work. You're not allowed to work on the job that you do every single day. You have to do something that's either going to improve yourself personally possibly improve the business, things along those lines. Uh, maybe it's taking classes in Excel or learning a programming class like a PHP or something like that. Maybe it's ballroom dancing, I don't know. If you do this consistently after six or nine months or whatnot, you will be so far ahead of where you thought you were. You don't want to get to the end of the year and say, well, I could have had a great year if I'd only done this, or I, I couldn't get to the year because I didn't have this done. Just go ahead and do it. Take the time, take the consistent time on a weekly basis, put it in your schedule, and you'll be way ahead by the time you get to the end of the year. Number three, you have to give. I got a lot of pictures of Brooke. He's not even here. <laughs> uh, number three, you have to give. And I'm talking about, of course, uh, charities and uh, fundraisers here. Um, you can't really get to be a business of, of a certain size without really getting involved in the giving culture. Investors want to see it. Uh, employees especially want to see it. They don't want to see a company that just sits there and is a cash cow and takes in all the profits. They want to see a company that participates in the community and participates in fundraisers. But I'm going to give you an even better reason. Besides giving to great uh, uh, charities, you're going to have a great opportunity to make really sticky and deep um, connections with your actual customers and friends in business. Uh, we actually see this all the time, right? You're in your Facebook feed and somebody's riding a bike for 10K for this, and somebody's running for this, or doing a, a color run, or whatnot. Um, those are really opportunities to make really good connections. They might be your customers, they might just be people in the industry, but you never know whether or not maybe there's a customer that has the exact same charity as you. Maybe there's somebody that really cares in the same thing, or maybe they just care about running 10Ks, and so do you. Those things carry on through time and become very, very consistent and strong business connections. This is one of the easiest ways that you can do that. Here's me at an early charity event. <laughs> Speaking of bad decisions. <laughs> All right, number four, get an office. Now, I know what you're going to say. Uh, I, I, I can't get an office. I, I, don't, I can't afford to get an office, or I don't want to. I work at home, these kinds of things. And I totally understand that. And some people say, you know, I do work at home, but I have, I have online groups. I've got, uh, I've got uh, mastermind groups and whatnot. And you can collaborate on online, but you can't get what I really want you to get if you have an office. You can't have that feeling. I want you to have this feeling when you're sitting at your desk and you've come to something either that's amazing in your brain or that's terrible and you don't know what to do. And I want you to know the feeling of being able to go up and, and, and go to another desk and, and bounce that off right at that particular moment, face to face. If you don't do it, if you don't follow this particular advice, um, you know, you, you'll, you'll probably be fine. But if you do do this and you come back to me, I guarantee you next year when we're at Affiliate Summit East and you come up to me, you're going to say, wow, you were really right. This was really impactful on my business for this next year. 
Here's Cherisail, World Penguin Day. Just a, a funny slide to illustrate our own office. Number five, uh, content is absolutely still going to be king. And this is something a little bit about the future, because it's a keynote. I wanted to talk about the future just a little bit. I know there's a lot of bloggers out there, a lot of uh, content providers, and a lot of them ask me on a regular basis, is this something I should be doing? Is this, is this where I should be at? Content is absolutely still going to be king. It's not going to matter what the medium is. It's not going to matter if we're doing it on our mobile phones or our, or our watches uh, or on a desktop or on television and newspapers. No matter what, this is always going to be the content uh, or the important thing. Um, so if you're out there blogging, just keep on doing it. If you're out there podcasting, just keep on doing it. It's so important, in fact, that I gave it its own slide. Blogs and podcasts will continue to be the most sought-after force, and as a result, they will continue to be the most difficult to recruit, engage, and cultivate. And why did I just tell you that? It's because there's a lot of retailers in the room, a lot of merchants, a lot of OPMs. And I hear it a lot. And they say, well, I, I want to get involved in these content, but it's difficult. Of course it's difficult. It's going to be the most valuable thing. You need to step up your game as a retailer or a merchant if you're going to get involved in this kind of world. Number six, you have to measure. Now, time out because this is a funny slide. Um, we keep a record of all the names that people call us when they call in. And, uh, and this is what it is. Uh, you know, they call in and they say, Sharon Sale, uh, or uh, my perfect at the top is Sheriff. That's my, that's my favorite, Sheriff Sale. Uh, there's, uh, oops, there's post office at the bottom. I don't even know how you, how do you get there? How do you get there? Anyway, it's a funny slide, so I put it up there. But, so measurements, I'm not just talking about, uh, Google Analytics, right? I'm not just talking about how many people come to my site. I've got two million visitors, whatever. I got these pages. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what you get in an offline business that you don't get in an online business. If you're an offline business, let's say you're a bookstore, and you're on the street and you see a customer walk in, you can watch them. You can see their body language. You can see the areas in the store that they go. You can watch where they get to a certain area and they're kind of puzzling and looking and wondering. And as a business owner, as a bookstore owner in this example, you could go up to them and you could be like, can I help you? Can I, can I get you past this particular hurdle? In online businesses, of course, this is more difficult. But there are ways to absolutely do it. I'm showing you a screenshot here of ShareASale's new um, uh, setup wizard, where a new retailer comes in and gets involved in our network. And then I'm showing it to you with a little heat map over it. This is one of the ways that we use to measure how people are interacting with our actual product. Now, the little red dots, for no one, anyone that's not familiar with heat maps, the little red dots are where people are actually clicking. And the one at the top in the middle there uh, is on an actual input box. So I would expect that. That's where somebody's typing in the amount of commission that they're going to pay for a specific program. So I expected that. But what I didn't expect and what became important was in the bottom right-hand corner, um, or bottom right-hand middle, where it says, you definitely can't read this. I, I didn't think of that when I made this slide, but it says, setup fee and deposit payment. And everybody's clicking on it. And it's not a link. There's nowhere to go. It's just like I'm just showing a graphical representation of the steps that you're going to go through. And setup fee and payment is like step 12, and we're on step one. And what I realized was, even when they were getting started, they wanted to know what it was going to be like, what it was going to cost. I wanted to know right away. I wanted to know the setup fee and the deposit. That was the most imp important thing to them. And even though it was on a previous page, they wanted to know right here. So we were able to fix that problem by watching the customer actually be in the store. Um, the other way you can do it uh, is obviously through watching the customer through an actual video. You can record how people are looking at your, st at your store. You can uh, see where they click, you can see where they stop, you can see things they type and interact with and all that kind of stuff. Um, this video doesn't have any actual purpose but just to show you that it can happen. So, um, The other thing I want to tell you is go to Tim Ash's keynote tomorrow. Right? Come on. All right, Tim's right here. And he knows far more about uh, conversion and really what, how to take that impact of a customer when they come in and, and converting them to an actual sale. So make sure you go to that tomorrow. It's 11 o'clock, I believe, in this exact same room. Number seven, beware of the guru culture. Now, this is uh, tennis guru uh, John McEnroe, of course, played by Cirrusail GM David Zelkin. Now, I'm not up here to, to, bash, uh, to bash gurus, of course. Um, uh, 
provide a lot of great education and a lot of great learning for people. What I'm really more concerned about is how all of you react to those gurus. Um, I see so much of the uh, folks putting people onto pedestals and people going around and, and, and really uh, not necessarily using an impactful, uh, relation or impactful meeting when they meet with these gurus. Um, for example, I, I personally love Mark Cuban. I think he's super smart. I love to listen to the stuff he does. Imagine if I was actually lucky enough to find myself in a situation where I met Mark and the only thing I got was like, hey Mark, let's get a selfie. That would be great folly on my part. Prepare yourself, if you have somebody that you look up to and you consider to be a guru of a certain topic, prepare yourself to ask them an actual question that can get you past something in your own business. Have it in your head at all times, just in case you run into them. And then you'll learn two things. One, when you ask the question, the answer back might be amazing. And so you'll justify everything you've ever done by putting this person on a pedestal and by, by looking after and by going and following their teachings. Or the answer could be absolutely terrible. They might not actually know what they're talking about. And that's even more valuable because if you find out that the person that you've been following doesn't actually have the knowledge that you need to get your business from point A to point B, well, then you can stop following them. And the third part about it is you're absolutely going to gain their respect. If you have someone who's a, a, an industry guru and you go up to them with a real impactful question and they're able to interact with you with a real actual relationship as opposed to selfie taking, they're going to respect that so much that your chances of actually interacting with that person in the future, again, emailing them, they're going to remember you. It's a much better way to approach that. Number eight, own up to your mistakes or don't make them at all. Here's a mistake, this logo. Here's another mistake. This hair. <laughs> Rob. Rob came from far away to watch that. Thank you. I'm not talking about those mistakes, though. I'm talking about other mistakes. I'm talking about mistakes that involve your actual business reputation. You're, you're, uh, um, you only get that one chance, right, to make a business, re business, uh, to make a business impression. Because we're who we are, we're share sale, we sit in between a lot of things. We sit in between merchants and affiliates. And sometimes affiliates, they try to, you know, they try to push the envelope a little bit. Sometimes they cross the line. Sometimes they violate terms, those kinds of things. Those mistakes happen. Uh, but what you don't want to do is take a mistake and compound it by, by further maybe trying to cover it up or lying about it. These are very, very bad decisions that you can make early on. It's the same reason that I play golf and why this picture's on the screen. It's why I play golf, because there's no faster way to uh, learn about somebody that you're possibly going to do business with than to play a round of golf with them. Golf's a game of complete honesty. Uh, you get to, at the end of the hole, you get to write down whatever your score is. Uh, if you hit it in the woods, you get to either kick it out or try and hit it. Um, you learn more about someone and their character by playing a round of golf with them. I've got some golf pictures for you. Another bad decision. Another one. Cargo shorts? Much better fashion. Number nine, get involved in something bigger. Now, what am I talking about here? I'm talking about you're even right here is what I'm talking about. You're part of Affiliate Summit. Um, the people that speak at conferences, uh, whether it's an affiliate summit, internet retailer, mo most of the time the people that speak at conferences are really those who volunteer to speak. Uh, those who want to get involved, they want to get out there, they want to put their name out there. Now, you might not be thinking, hey, I'm not a good speaker, maybe I don't know uh, something about a topic, but you absolutely do. The knowledge that's in your head, um, you should go out there and put it out there. The, the reaction that you have, the number of uh, friends that you'll make, the number of connections that you make just by speaking at one session um, is astronomical. Oh, that's me speaking. And if you don't speak, uh, Get involved in another way. Go to the events. Go to the karaoke. Go to the networking events. Make sure you put yourself out there as someone who is going to be part of this industry. It's part of something bigger. Um, I'm not going to give a whole speech about the PMA, the Performance Marketing Association, the trade groups, but you should get involved in those trade groups that are part of your industry. If your main industry is affiliate marketing, then great. That's yours. If you have a cooking blog, maybe it's the Cookers Association of America. I don't know. Get involved in it, a local chamber of commerce. The impact you will have, again, this is one of those things, you'll come up to me at the next one, next summit, and you'll say, thank you for telling me to do that. I should have done it, and I did it. 
Number 10, I want you to be loyal. Now, there's a guy out there on the campaign trail. I mean, you've undoubtedly seen him on TV, Donald Trump. He would probably tell me I was wrong here. He would probably say, uh, you know, business, business only, business first, business. There's no friends in business, all that kind of stuff. And although he didn't say that uh, necessarily, I'm assuming he would. I got to disagree with that. Um, business is not just about numbers. Business isn't just about who has the newest thing, who's got the best price over here, who's got the, uh, the most exciting product or the one that looks the coolest. Business is about people and building relationships. You need to be loyal to the companies who help you get to where you've gotten. You need to expect loyalty from those that you uh, uh, work with. There's another slide on being loyal. And it leads me to my last one. It leads me to this. Why did I show you all of these pictures? And this has got to be my favorite picture of them all, right? This was a no-brainer. I was going through all the pictures. I was like, no, I have to have this picture, all right? I showed you all these pictures because even with the best product in the entire world, you can get absolutely nowhere without people. And it's my business justification number four. You need to surround yourself with the very best. Now, these could be customers. They could be employers. They could be the vendors that you work with. But the choices that you make to have uh, and who you're going to involve yourself in your business are extraordinarily important. Who you justify your business to is just important as how you justify it. The companies that are out there, you love these companies, not just for what they do, but for who they are. Uh, the Shaft Partner Centrics of the World, Greg Hoffman Consulting, he's an affiliate summit, Kim Rowley, <laughs> Fanatics, and even ShareASale, if I can toss myself in there for a second. They're good companies as much for what they do, as much for, I'm sorry, their character as they are for their product. Now, there's one really quick last quote for you. If you hang out with chickens, you're going to cluck. If you hang out with eagles, you're going to fly. And I've shown you these pictures today because I want you to know who my eagles are, who the people are that I uh, learned to fly with, so to speak, that I grew my business with. And I also want you to know that they're actually all in this room, the majority of them. So as you are here, remember, let's go back to the very beginning. And I said, you've made a huge investment to get here. You've spent time. You've spent money. Use this investment. Go out. I want you to see every single exhibit out there in that exhibit hall. I want you to go talk to all those people. I want you to ask them questions. I want you to find out if they're eagles or chickens. I want you to go to every single networking event, the karaoke. I want you to go to the parties. Make this investment count. Remember why you came here. <laughs> I want to thank Ashley for a wonderful introduction, and most of all, I want to thank uh, Missy and Sean for uh, having some faith in me and some trust and putting me up here in front to talk to you. I'd like to thank you all for listening to me as well, and that is the end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.